Good morning. Welcome to Ridgecrest Baptist Church. We're so glad you joined us this morning for worship. We want to remind you of a few things going on at Ridgecrest right now. First thing is we're making masks for healthcare workers. If you are interested in helping us with that, we'd love for you to go to our website under ministries and you will see the link that you can click on that will show you how to make masks for our healthcare workers. You can drop those off at Ridgecrest um, during the day during business hours. Also, we want to remind you of our online Bible studies still going on. Um, you can go on to our Get Connected on our website, and you'll see the links for those. Um, it goes from adult all the way down to children. So we encourage you to go and sign up for one of those. And I want to remind you about our church app. Church Center app is our fairly new app that we are using. Um, we encourage you to download that onto your phone or tablet. Um, you can do that through your Google Store or Apple Store. Um, you, can, you can see that all of your different information about yourself, um, as well as the different groups you're in, you can give as well and go to our website from that. So we encourage you to do that as, um, to get involved with our church. Also, uh, we want to remind you of our prayer meeting that's online and you can, we'll get an email. If you're a member of our church, you'll get an email with the link for the prayer meeting. And you can join us on Saturday at 6.30. And we're doing that every Saturday. And don't forget the different ways you can give. While we're in this special time, you can uh, give your check through mail. You can bring it up to church. And also you can go through our app and our website to give. We hope you have a great weekend. everyone. I hope you are abundantly well this morning. Welcome to worship at Ridgecrest. My name is Kendra and I am the minister to children here at Ridgecrest. We are so excited to have you with us today. Because we have children listening in with their families at home this morning, we want to emphasize that this time of worship and learning is for them also. Kids, we hope that you're sitting comfy with your parents and ready to learn this morning. I'm here with a special listening challenge for each of you today. Luke 8.18 challenges us as believers to be careful how you hear. In other words, pay attention to how you listen. So I want you to grab your Bibles, your notebooks, and your pens today and get ready to learn. Pastor Neil is teaching us about the church today. We're going to focus on the fact that our church is not a building. The word church was never meant to be assigned to a building. Rather, the church is a body of believers. It's you and it's me, devoted followers of Jesus Christ. So I want to share my challenge with each of you today. It's a little bit different, so listen carefully. There's a special key word that I want you to listen for during Pastor Neil's sermon today. When you hear it, count it. That's right, I want you to count how many times Pastor Neil says the word church in his sermon today and write it down. Whoever gets closest to the correct answer this week is going to get a special prize delivered by Miss Kendra to your doorstep. I want you to remind your mom and dad, text me or email me with your best guess by Monday morning. In addition to listening for your keyword today, be sure to write down words from our sermon that you don't understand so you can talk about it with your families at the end of today's message. Some of these words can be confusing, and we want to make sure that you understand exactly what Pastor Neil is sharing about today. Families, I want to encourage you, even your youngest listeners can participate in the worship today. Make a small play area in the room where you're worshiping together and interact with them during the service. Kids, we hope you enjoy this week's listening challenge. Good luck, and we'll talk to you tomorrow morning. Families, enjoy your time of worship together today.
just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou Good morning, Ridgecrest. Uh, what a great day of worship it's been, and 
Uh, we just praise the Lord that uh, you've been able to be with us this morning. Uh, my name is David Iannacone. I'm the Minister of Missions here at Ridgecrest Baptist Church. And uh, we just want to take this time to celebrate the Lord. You know, every uh, week it is our tradition uh, to look back upon that week and see what God has done in our midst and how he's been working in the life of our church, especially in these uh, challenging times. We look forward to just seeing what God has done. And one of the things uh, that uh, we can kind of check as a, a, a celebration and a, you know, a win, if you will, is uh, we had our very first Zoom business meeting last Sunday night. Uh, it, it was incredible. We had uh, over 90 people on Zoom. We, uh, we voted for new members to join our church and uh, changed out a, a trustee in our, in our committee and uh, did uh, heard a lot of great things that God is doing in the midst of our church, how he's blessing our church financially in a great way and how he's caring for us and how he loves us and is doing just so much. There's just so much that has gone on uh, and God's church uh, is, is that light in the world that cannot be contained, that can't be constrained. Uh, it's just awesome to see how God works in and through his people, no matter whether we're sequestered, no matter whether we're in our rooms, uh, no matter where we are, God's grace is everywhere. And, and God uh, is, I think, reaching the world in a great and significant way uh, that uh, he's using his church to do. Uh, I saw a little meme uh, that said, uh, I didn't know my pastor would become a TV evangelist. <laughs> it was funny to me to see that, but it's not just our, our pastor, but literally thousands and thousands of pastors are beaming their message around the world, and a great harvest is taking place. And in the midst of all that, in spite of what we're going through and the things that we're, uh, the challenges that we're meeting every day, God is there with us. He sustains us. He guides us. He gives us grace. And so I just want to read uh, Psalm 61 here, the first four verses, because I think it's so apropos to what God is doing in the midst of our life, of our church, and our world. It says, Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Let me Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. You know, God's wings are broad. They're as big as the universe, and they, they, they encompass all of us. And the neat and wonderful thing about our God is that he is so immense that he created and contains the universe, but so personal that he lives within each of our hearts and communes with each of us personally. So we want to celebrate that. We want to just take this time to just thank God for what he is doing in our midst. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you so much for your grace and your mercy and your love and your continual care. Uh, your love endures forever. It never fails. And so we thank you, Lord, that even in the midst, in all the ways that, that we've been, uh, seem to have been uh, pulled apart, uh, you have brought us together. Your church stands strong. Not because of what we've done, not just simply because of Zoom meetings and, and all those fancy technology things that we're doing, but Lord, your spirit reigns in the heart of each and every one of us. And so I just thank you, Lord, that, that you possess us, that you are uh, contained uh, in, in our spirit, that you, that you guide us and that we are your temple that we give you the opportunity and the ability to uh, use us every day as we obediently uh, serve you in whatever way we can, no matter what capacities that have been limited, we've been limited to, you are not limited. And so we just thank you, Lord, that as our grace uh, that you bestow upon us is not only brought to us, but as we are channels of that grace, and, and uh, send it out to others. We send not only goodness, uh, not only help, 
but the gospel of Jesus Christ. For we know, Lord, that, that your gospel message goes throughout the entire world, uh, that it demonstrates that you love the world so much that you gave your only son, Jesus Christ. And so we, we celebrate that, Lord. We thank you for your love. We thank you, God, that in these times, you cover us with it, and we are sheltered by you. And yet, Lord, we are also used by you. What a great and wonderful thing that you do for us. And we want to glorify you in all we say and do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hello, Ridgecrest. It's good to be able to worship with you today. We're going to start a new series today that I'm really excited about. Uh, I've had this in my preaching plan for a while, and I'm really looking forward to uh, delivering this message of truth today. We're going to be talking about the church in our series. We are still the church. And what is the church? We could first start off our conversation about really thinking about who we are as a body of believers. As you saw the video clip earlier, right before I preach. The church is not a building. It's not brick and mortar. It's the body of believers. The word church does not appear in the Old Testament. It's solely a New Testament word that is divine, used to define Christians, those who profess faith in Jesus Christ. If we look at the New Testament in chronological order, the first letter that's written with the word church in it would be the letter of James. It was written around 50 AD, and James wrote this as the first letter word church appears in the new testament in james chapter 5 verse 14 he said is anyone among you sick let them call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the lord what a relevant passage for us today throughout our land many are sick some are ill from the coronavirus some are ill from other sicknesses but i notice in this passage that it encourages believers to call on those who are pastors teachers leaders to pray for them and to anoint them with oil to help to encourage them for healing and so i would encourage you today if maybe you're struggling and want to see us pray for you let us know uh, we would gladly pray for you in the church and also we gladly pray for you on our saturday night prayer time together but I would encourage you, we can probably do that via phone call or text or Zoom. It may be a little bit different than being in person, but we'd still love to pray for you. But after this mention of the word church, the letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonian believers would be the second earliest letter, really work, that contains the word church. And in that, he said this. He said, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, grace to you and peace. Well, our church today could surely need some grace and peace today. And we can have it. We can have it because it's found in the body of Christ. But throughout the New Testament, the word church was never really addressed in the form of that of a building or a location. It was addressed as a body of believers. The word church in the Greek is the word ekklesia. It means assembly, gathering. Literally, it means called out. The word occurs 114 times in the New Testament, and out of those times, I like how Herschel Hobbes put it, he said 93 of those times refer to the local body of believers, the body of Christ, what we are today at Ridgecrest. Not a building, not a location, it's a group of believers, and we today are the body of believers that have been called out. 
Now I know this can be difficult to fathom in our current situation. It feels like we have been called in. We're isolated. We're secluded. It sometimes doesn't make us feel like someone who's been called out by God. But that term is an interesting term if you think about it. Called out. Well, what are we called out of? I believe Peter addressed that well in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. This is what he said. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into marvelous light. We've been called out of darkness. We've been called out of sin. We've been called out of wicked living and have been called to live in the marvelous light of God. God has called us out of darkness, that is spiritual death, and he's called us into light, that is spiritual life in Christ. You know, he's called the church to remember that the old is gone and that the new has come. But what does that look like for us today? For many of us, we may be looking at our current situation and wondering, how are we still the church? Let's be honest, it's difficult to look at our current situation and wonder how the church is going to continue to thrive in this way. I mean, come on, we can't physically meet together to worship. We can't partake of the Lord's Supper together. We can't greet each other with a holy kiss, is what the Bible tells us to do. Now, granted, some of us aren't going to go around holy kissing each other, but, you know, a fist pump or bump, a, a chest bump or a handshake or a hug, we can't really do that right now in this time period. Can't physically meet together in our life groups Now, some, of course, we have the Zoom resource to be able to do that, to see each other's faces, which is a good place to start, but we can't be together to fellowship in the way that we'd like to do. We can't even share the love of Christ, it seems like, with the people that God places in our paths. I mean, we have to stay six feet away from people. It feels almost like we are not the church. And I personally, like many of you listening, miss being together on a regular basis together. Ridgecrest, when the church is scattered, let me encourage you today, we can still gather. But you may say, well, it feels different. Let me give you some words of encouragement. It may feel different, but it's not different. We are still the church today. We are still a part of the body of Christ, even though we physically cannot meet together. But yet we are still a part of the body of Christ. And I want to talk to you about what that looks like today. And so I want to talk to you about the makeup of the church. As I was putting this sermon together, I thought about the term makeup and what some women go through to put themselves together. Uh, I went online to do some research on this because obviously, uh, you know, looking at me, I would have a great lack of knowledge on this because I don't use makeup. And so I had to do a little bit of research on this. I I didn't realize how complicated it was uh, for a woman to put on makeup and how many different steps there were until I went online. I learned that a woman does not just start by adding anything they want to add and then just go in any order they choose. But that there's a certain progression and there's a certain way to actually put on the pieces of makeup that are required to make all the other pieces of makeup go and look correct on a woman. Well, here's... An application order that I found on Pinterest. Take a look at this picture. Now, I don't know if it's completely af- accurate. After all, I have no knowledge about the subject of how to put on makeup. But look at it. Moisturizer you put on first, then primer, then foundation, then concealer. Uh, it feels like to me like we're painting a bedroom. <laughs> then you got number five. You got bronzer and blush and powder and eyeshadow and eyeliner, then mascara, then eyebrows and lips, and then a setting spray. I didn't even realize you had to take a certain spray to put it all together that it would set. Now, granted, most probably, most women probably don't use all these pieces of makeup, but each one is necessary, maybe, to have this so-called perfect face with makeup on it. I personally like how, like and love how my wife looks without makeup. Uh, but every so often, sometimes she'll use some of these uh, pieces of makeup to make herself even lovelier. But what if we were to look at the church in this manner? What makes the church look like the church? What are the pieces that are necessary to make the church look beautiful? Well, the word of the Lord gives us a great picture about what makes up the church. And so this morning, if you have your Bibles, Bible apps, whatever you have, turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 41 through 47. A very familiar passage in 
the book of really second Luke, if you will. This is most likely Luke's second work. And so you're going to be looking at this passage, and we're going to see right after Peter finished preaching a message in Jerusalem and Judea, this is what the word of the Lord tells us in verse 41. So those who received his word from that message he preached were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The church, as we think about who we are as the body of Christ, what the word of God tells us about who the church is, the Baptist faith and message as we celebrate the 20th anniversary this year of that document gives us a summation of what the church looks like. Here's what it says. A New Testament church of the Lord Jesus Christ is an autonomous local congregation of baptized believers associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the two ordinances of Christ, governed by his laws, exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word, and seeking to extend the gospel to the ends of the earth. And each congregation operates under the lordship of Christ through democratic processes. In such a congregation, each member is responsible and accountable to, the, to Christ as Lord. And its scriptural officers are pastors and deacons. While both men and women are gifted for service in the church, the office of pastor is limited to men as qualified by scripture. The New Testament church then speaks also of the church as the body of Christ, which includes all of the redeemed of all the ages, believers from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. We would call that the local church and the universal church and how they're set apart. But in this passage of scripture that we looked at in Acts chapter 2, we're going to see some of the essential parts, pieces if you will, that are needed to form the makeup of God's church. And so let's examine those pieces today and see what the word of the Lord has to tell us about what the church should look like And how we measure up. The first thing he says here in verse 41 is that the church should be devoted believers in Jesus Christ. So those who received his word, Luke said. Well, what was the word to which they received? It was the message that was preached by Peter at Pentecost. And here's a summation of really Peter's message at Pentecost. Jesus, he was proclaiming to the people. He was the long-awaited Messiah that was prophesied about. He performed great wonders and great signs. And it's seen by many people. But yet the Jews and many of the lawless people of that day killed him. But he didn't stay dead for long. Peter preached in his message that God raised him up and seated him at the right hand of the Father. And that now Jesus dwells next to the Father and he sent his Holy Spirit amongst the people to indwell in the hearts and the lives of believers. What did Peter preach? He preached that Jesus was the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. And so he finished preaching this message and the people heard and responded to that message and they believed in who Jesus Christ was and who he is. It's an important part of the piece of the puzzle as we formulate these pieces for makeup of the church that the church has got to have believers. The start of the early church, this was the most important piece, if you will. You cannot have a church without people who believe in the Son of God. You cannot have a church without people who have been called out of the darkness and have been called into the marvelous marvelous light. The people who have been rescued from spiritual death and now have spiritual life in Jesus Christ. If Ridgecrest Baptist Church had no believers, we would not be Ridgecrest Baptist Church. Because our church consists of people who have professed faith and belief in the Son of God. Well, what's the second makeup piece? It would be not only believers, but there would also be baptized believers. Devoted, baptized believers would make up the church. Verse 41 continued and said, they were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. 
the people who expressed a belief in Jesus were baptized. They went under the water, showing their death to the old way of life. And they came up out of the water, showing their new life in Jesus Christ. Now we're going to talk more about baptism next week when we look at the marks of the church. But let's move to the third thing that was important for the church, is that they were devoted to being taught the word of the Lord. In verse 42, he tells us this, and they devoted themselves, Luke said, to the apostles' teaching. The Bible is our life map. It's our spiritual food. It is our way of understanding how we can be the church. It's the exhortation of the word of the Lord. It's what we're doing right now. We're hearing the word being preached, being taught through what I'm teaching right now. And the early church had that, that they would hear those teachers teaching and they would listen to what the word of the Lord told them so that they would continue to grow in their relationship with Christ. Now, not everyone is called to preach or teach. The Bible tells us that, but everyone is called to listen. I think about the biblical leaders in the Bible that fall under this category. The pastors and the deacons even fall into this area. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28 tells us about some of these offices. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles and gifts of healing, helping, administration, and various kinds of tongues. In the Southern Baptist Church, there are normally two offices or officers that we look at. Uh, we read about it a little bit ago in the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. Its scriptural officers are pastors and deacons. One of our pastors in this church is me. I lead the church. I'm the lead pastor. But we have other pastors that serve faithfully. Dave and Chris and Kendra. And now Josh that's being brought onto our team that shepherd the flock that are there to encourage and to help guide and to strengthen through teaching the very word of truth. And we are blessed at this church not only to have the ministers, but to have those deacons that are serving. We have 18 deacons that are reaching out to teach and to open up their hearts and lives to you. Many of you have been contacted by your deacon, and I hope you're able to get in touch with them. If you have any needs or concerns, they want to help you and pray for you and strengthen you. But currently, we try to keep in touch with each other as best we can, but the church, the believers who have been called out of darkness, they needed biblically-based leaders and a strong dedication to the Word of God. Nothing has changed today. Our church focuses on the Word of God. That is our main resource that we use and all of our teaching is the bible and so we teach it and we believe that it's important for everyone to understand how they can have faith and trust and live forever for all eternity but the fourth thing that i noticed in this passage was that they were devoted to fellowship the church was devoted to fellowship in verse 42 the word koinonia where we get the word fellowship community or association even intimacy is a part of that now, this is an intimate bond that only believers can have with other believers. We are bonded over our connection to Jesus Christ. And this connection even gives us a deeper connection with our other brothers and sisters in Christ. And this bond, I love this bond because it's permanent. It's shared with us now on this earth through that of what we call the local church. Those local pockets of believers like our church and other churches throughout the world. But also it's bonded for all eternity and that of the universal church. Those that are believers in the past that have gone on to be with Jesus now in the present. Those that are going to continue to go on today and those that will go on in the future when we are perhaps dead and gone. The fact is, is that we are all a part of this unique bond as believers in Christ. And so spending life with each other, it's important to have that. But friends, I long to be connected with you and to spend time of fellowship with you when we finally get to be back together. I know that's probably what many of us are missing. That time to spend with each other, to encourage each other and uplift each other in the Lord. But the church was also this, the fifth thing I noticed. They were devoted to partaking of the Lord's Supper. In verse 42 he says, Luke says, to the breaking of bread. As a body of believers would assemble, they would often partake of the elements, the cup and the bread to remember the death of Jesus Christ. And we will one day get to partake of those elements again when we get to meet back together. And that time will come. It's not today, but I'll let you know when it gets closer to when we're going to be able to do that. But I want to encourage you to think about how we remember and reflect on his death on a constant basis. Because he gave his very life for you and for me. And we're going to be talking more about this when we look at the marks of the church, baptism and Lord's Supper in the next weeks to come.
But the sixth thing that the church did is that they were devoted to prayer. And the prayers, it says in verse 42. In other words, the church would not be the church if it did not talk to God. That's what prayer is. It's talking to the Lord. And we should be a people that pray to the Lord on a regular basis. It goes beyond breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The early church recognized the power behind prayer. They surely remember Jesus' statement before he left them about what prayer can accomplish. Listen to what he said in John chapter 14, verses 13 through 14. He said, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. And that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. We've got to be a people of prayer. But sadly today, many churches throughout our land and our world today are not churches that focus in on prayer but our church desires to never neglect prayer i can remember when i came here three years ago and i sat down with chris and we were going over the worship service and he was showing me what we like to do in worship and i said chris i said here's one thing i want to make sure that we have in here i want us to make sure that we always have a place for prayer because prayer moves the heart and the will of our lord we see throughout the bible many people prayed and god answered in powerful ways and so we did that we put a segment in that's called the prayer and praise time uh that's really almost a seven seven minute segment to praise the lord for what he's doing and then to go to the lord in prayer but i know this is so important to us that we want to always be a people of prayer and i'd encourage you if you haven't been to our saturday night zoom prayer meeting at 6 30 i pray that you go to our website that you check it out and that you get, a, get connected with us on that. Or call the church if you don't know how to do it. And we'd be glad to set you up with being a part of that prayer time together. It's so sweet to be able to go to the Lord with our requests, with the things that we need. But also to adore the Lord for who he is in that prayer meeting. But prayer meetings are extremely important. John MacArthur once said this about prayer meetings. He said, prayer meetings attract only the faithful few. That is undoubtedly the reason for much of the weakness in the contemporary church we don't want to be that we don't want to be a weak church we want to be a church that gets on our knees and cries out to the lord we need to be a church that's praying paul told the church at thessalonica the importance of this he said pray without ceasing in other words always be in a constant state of prayer whenever and wherever we are prayer fellowship the studying of the word the lord's supper and baptism are all essential elements to a thriving church luke also said it this way about the early church and something that should be taking part is that they were devoted to a sense of awe in verse 43 he said an awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles the word awe here is the word phobos it's the word where we get our word fear from or phobia dread or terror it can even be a sense of awe the word in this verse focuses really on a holy awe of the many wonderful things that were taking place through the works of the apostles. In other words, the people were not in awe over the immaculate houses of worship. They weren't in awe over the innumerable programs that kept believers occupied. They weren't in awe over the inconsistency of other believers. They were in awe of the incredible power of God that was in the work of the believers. You know, God is doing something great right now. Many people probably don't see what he's doing. I know like many pastors, I'm praying for revival in our land. Rick Warren recently, the pastor at Saddleback, was asked in an interview a couple weeks ago, where is God in the midst of this pandemic? And I love his response. This is the response that Rick Warren gave. He said, he is in the hearts of his people. All those people you would see out there helping others, that is God in the hearts of those people. Our body of believers and the believers all across this world need to get back to having a sense of awe of what God is doing right now in our world. He's using people to proclaim his message and to show people how they can have a relationship and hope in God. And he's done great things in the past. He's going to continue to do great things in the present. I believe he's going to do some amazing things for us in the future. But also the church was devoted. The eighth thing I noticed was they were devoted to meeting together. Verse 44a says, And all who believed were together. The early church met together physically. Right now, of course, this is different for us. There will come a day when we'll get to physically meet together again. 
But in the meantime, we should do our best to connect by watching the worship service like many of you are doing right now or getting involved in one of our online group Bible studies or life groups. But if you don't have the internet, I'd encourage you to reach out maybe to others who don't, maybe call or text or maybe send a letter of encouragement to somebody in the church to encourage them today. We could still be the church even though we cannot physically meet together in this building, this house of worship today. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 through 25 reminds us of this. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works and not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The end is coming. We don't know when it will be, but yet we want to be encouragement to those around us until that day comes to show the world that there is hope, there's peace, there's comfort, and there's rest in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The ninth thing that the church did and that was a big part of what made up the church was that they were unified and they were devoted to unity and they had all things in common. The church was unified in its mission and in its objective. They focused on what made them called out ones because they were called out of darkness for a purpose and they now had been given a new family to look out after. And so the early church was unified in their beliefs. And they were also unified in their mission to help those in need. And that's the 10th thing. They were devoted to assisting those in need. Verse 45 tells us, And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. The believers voluntarily sold what they did not need in order to assist those who had needs. The church was generous with the ones who needed something. Ridgecrest, the body of believers here, is still generous today. Uh, I'd encourage you, I know many are losing jobs, many are being laid off. I'd encourage you if you need help and assistance, uh, and you really need that assistance, to contact us. And we'd love to help you as much as we can to, to assist in this situation, this pandemic that has hit our world today. But the body of believers looks out for the body of believers. Many have contributed and given extra money to our family in need resource that goes out to help those because we believe in helping each other out hebrews chapter 13 verse 16 tells us this do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to god it's a great joy to sacrifice by giving to the church by giving to those in need and by assisting those when maybe you don't have a need of your own right now But to help out maybe somebody in need, I encourage you to do that. The early church, that made them who they were. That they looked around and said, that person needs something. Well, I'm going to sell this so that they can have what they need. It's a powerful message that we display when we show the world and we show other believers that we are all in this battle together. The 11th thing that the church did to make them up the way that they were, to be a beautiful church, was that they were devoted to consistency in worship. Verse 46 tells us this. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. The believers were excited to meet together in their homes and in the temple to worship the Lord. And they had a desire to worship the Lord at any chance they could. You know, the early church did not dread worship. They delighted in worship. My prayer is that when you hit the play button at the beginning of our worship time together, that you are excited about getting to praise the Lord through song, to praise the Lord through talking to Him in prayer, to praise the Lord by opening up His Word and growing in your relationship with Christ, to be devoted to consistency in worship as much as we possibly can to grow in our relationship with God. The early church was focused on that, and we should be today as well. The twelfth thing that the church was focused on, they were devoted to being joyful in all circumstances. Verse 46 continued and said, They received their food with glad and generous hearts. They were gracious and they were excited with what they had in front of them. And it's an amazing thing to think about because if you really think about what has happened to this point, Jesus has died. Jesus has been buried. He rose from the dead three days later. He was with them for 40 days and then he, boom, he ascended into heaven. He's gone. What are they to do? Well, the church was joyous. They were excited 
Not that their Lord had left them, but the fact that their Lord had given them what they needed to serve in this world today. We've been blessed in the same way, and God has given us great joy today. But what about you? Where is your sense of joy? You know, the makeup of the church consists of joy and of a generous heart. And so maybe that's our prayers. God, help me to be joyful. Help me to be generous in this time. Thirteenth thing that the church was is that they were devoted to worshiping the Lord. Verse 47 tells us that they were praising God. You know, the church cannot be the church unless they praise the Lord. This primarily, I believe, we do through song. We are called to praise the Lord through singing. And that doesn't mean you have to have the perfect voice to be harmonious with everything. That just means that you praise the Lord by singing it out in your heart. The Bible tells us in Psalm 150, verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I think about it right now as I did this weekly update this week. I didn't even think about it, but I sung at the end of our weekly update. And so if you want to hear me sing, you might want to go check up that weekly update on our website. But I had that opportunity to praise the Lord in song because that's what we're called to do, is to sing out our joy and our excitement and to have that generous heart because we love Him and because we want to worship Him and glorify His name. We do that because he's worthy. The 14th and last thing that we do here as a church is that we're devoted to sharing Christ. Verse 47b tells us, And having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Romans chapter 10 verse 14 tells us, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching, without someone proclaiming, without somebody exhorting, without somebody saying, this is who God is. Ridgecrest, we should always seek to help those in our world to see who Christ is. What makes up the church? What makes us Ridgecrest in who we are? When we look at the Bible, it tells us exactly what the church should look like. Well, how do we do that here at Ridgecrest? How do we accomplish these 14 things in our church? We do that through our, really our purpose statement of who we are and the three things that we strive to do here at Ridgecrest. And that's worship, that's grow, and that's share. To worship the Lord, the one true God, through song and through the preaching of his word and through prayer. To grow in our understanding of his word. We do this through the study of his word, through life groups and small groups, through personal devotions that we even have with the Lord at our homes. And we also do this by sharing, by sharing the love of Christ with the people that God places in our paths. We do this by helping others and by sharing our faith. What is the makeup of the church? The church is made up, as we've seen, by believers in Jesus Christ who have been baptized. It is made up of people who love the word of the Lord and love to be taught God's word. The church is made up of people who fellowship together, who partake of the Lord's Supper together, and who who are focused on spending time with the Lord in prayer. The church is made up of people who have a sense of awe and wonder at the things that our God has done and will continue to do in the future. The church desires to be united at all times and seek to meet together for corporate worship on a regular basis. And finally, we saw that the church desires to be joyful in the midst of the trials that are faced in front of us and to continue to help those in need that are in physical need or even greater spiritual need. So I pray that we as Ridgecrest Baptist Church are the church. And when I look at these 14 things of the makeup of the early church, I see that in our church today. And I hope you do as well. But God, help us each day to be like that early church. And so let's pray that today. Father God, I pray that you would help us today. As we've seen all of these things that we've looked up, these 14 things to see what the early church was made up of. And Lord, today what we need to be made up of The first thing that we looked at on that list was believers. Well, maybe somebody today has heard this message of truth and says, you know what, I want to put my faith faith and my trust in God. If that's you today, you can say this to God and have a relationship with Him for all eternity. You can talk to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the things that I've done against you and against your word. The Bible calls that sin. I pray, God, that you would forgive me of my sin. 
I pray, Jesus, that you would come into my life, that you would be my Lord, my boss, my master, and my savior. And help me, Jesus, to live my life for you. If you made that decision, that's the greatest decision that you'll ever make, to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And many of us have made that decision to put our faith and trust in Jesus. And as we look at this list of 14 things, some of us today may look at it and go, you know what, I'm struggling with this one, with number seven. I'm struggling with number five or number 10. And maybe today's the day that we say, God, I need your help to help me look like the church of what the church should look like. And God, I pray that we remember the church is made up of believers that love you and that are called according to your, to your purpose, that are called out of darkness, that are called into marvelous light. And so, Father, help us to live out our lives to bring you glory, to bring you honor, and to be, bring you praise, to look at our lives and to look at our church here at Ridgecrest and to say, you know what? We look like the church should look like. God, that's because we look at your word and we know exactly what it tells us to look like. And so, Father, we thank you for that. Help us today to be bold, to live out our faith, Lord, in the way that you've called us to live it out. And so, Lord Jesus, we praise you today and we worship you. Thank you for letting us be the church today. It's in your name, Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Well, Ridgecrest, I want to thank you for worshiping with us today through the songs that we've sung, the time that we've spent in prayer, and the opportunity to dive into Acts chapter 2 and to see what the church really looks like. And we, I believe, have done that this morning. I encourage you to stay strong, to stay faithful, to continue to get connected on our website with things that can keep you in touch with other believers and also with what's going on in the life of our church. Even though we're scattered, we still gather. And so we are very excited about being able to do that in these forms on the online resources that we have. But I want to thank you again for continuing to pray about what's going on in our world, to continue to help and assist the church through your financial gifts, to continue to give to the Finn ministry for helping those in need. I want to thank you for continuing to be faithful in the midst of this time. And so I want to encourage you, Rich Christ, stay faithful, stay strong, and continue to remember that we are the church and we are all in this battle together i love you rich crest praying for you have a great week rich crest